Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hi and welcome to this MPTL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at uh, T.S. Eliot's poem uh, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock which we started in the last lecture. So just to reiterate what you've covered already, so we talked about the, uh, the entire dimension of time and embodiment and neurosis in this particular poem and how the two different narratives of time in conflict with each other. We have clock time which is standard time and we also have psychological time or mental time. And we refer to a philosopher called Henri Bergson, the French philosopher in time, who was massively influential in terms of the modernist's appropriation of time. So uh, just to uh, recap very quickly the last chance that we did. So when the male speaker, the neurotic male speaker in this poem says, in a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse, he's talking about the entire psychological situatedness of time. And how does he embody himself in, in relation to that? So embodiment is also, among other things, uh, temporal in Prefox. So it's spatio-temporal, is how you embody yourself in a particular space. So we see he has a crisis of embodiment in terms of trying to situate himself in a particular space and on this very privileged space, uh, presumably white, presumably privileged, presumably high culture space. He wants to get access there. That's the room where women come and go, talking to Michelangelo. He can't really get in there. So the entire poem is about procrastination and about trying to get in there. So the embodiment is obviously very spatial, but equally it's quite temporal in quality. So it's talking about the psychological situatedness of time. And he can't put a psychological time in sync with clock time. That's one of the crises in this particular poem that is completely out of sync, psychological time and clock time. And that informs the crisis and embodiment to a large extent. Okay, so now we just move on to the next stanza, which is again quite synesthetic. We talked about synesthesia yesterday as being this very complex cognitive condition where the different sensory perceptions, the normative sensory perceptions get crisscrossed. So in other words, you smell what you see, you hear what you touch, etc. So tactility, visuality, orality, uh, olfactory sensations, they all combine together to generate a very complex cognitive condition, which can be medical, which can be spiritual, which can be mystical. Uh, it can be a combination of all those factors. Now, we have in this stanza that is on your screen, uh, when he says, I've known them already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. Again, a classic metaphysical conceit, something which spent some time on yesterday as well. So, you know, we saw how Eliot was heavily boring on the metaphysical quality of poetry. We have two different disparate elements uh, combined together to create a, a metaphor which has, among other things, a shocking effect, right? So it conveys a sense of shock, it conveys a sense of shudder, which we saw, uh, you know, and those of you interested in metaphysical poetry remember John Donne and Andrew Marvel, they use it quite consistently there. And Eliot is obviously uh, appropriating that, that quality, that tradition of poetry. So we have a way, uh, uh, the speaker is saying, for I have known them already, known them all. I've known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. So again, this whole idea of measuring out your life, which is mystical, existential, abstract, with something so banal and material as coffee spoons, it has, among other things, a shocking effect. And that shock is very deliberately conveyed and constructed uh, to the audience. And then you have this, I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a further room, so how should I presume? So again, look at the uh, tactility of voices, the tactility of what is normatively the olfactory thing, the voice is dying. You can almost touch it, right? So the entire sense of, you know, something which is olfactory, something which is oral, something which appeals to the sound, sense of hearing is being talked about in terms of something tactile and palpable. So again, this is, again, a very synesthetic experience. Right, and I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, and when I'm formulated, sprawling on a, on a pin, when I'm pin and wriggling on the wall, and how should I begin to spit out the butt ends of my days and ways, and how should I presume? So again, look at the butt ends, which is to say the cigarette ends. So the entire day is compared to a cigarette. So the day coming to an end has been compared to the cigarette burning out at the end of the activity of smoking. So again, we have something very abstract, the day coming to an end, abstract, temporal, you know, intellectual, and we have something as banal and material as a butt end of a cigarette combined together. The metaphors come together to create a sense of metaphysical conceit. 
which is obviously getting a moderner spin in Eliot's poetry. Now, prior to that, if you take a look at the image of the eyes uh, fixing you to a formulated phrase, so it's like a gaze coming at him. And it's very important to no notice the gaze in Eliot's early poetry, and we talked about yesterday in the lecture that we had before, how the gaze is very cinematic in quality in Eliot's early poetry. Uh, it borrows a lot from the contemporary uh, culture of cinema. So we have this notion of close-up, particularly in this episode where we have this subject sprawling on a pen, so, which is to say it's like a camera technique, it's like a trick camera thing where the human being is situated on a pen. So it's some kind of a montage technique of magnification and condensation where the human body is put on a pen in some cinematic trick image. And that's something which we see in Elliot Dubois. Yeah. It also is quite Kafkaesque in quality, the entire idea of the man becoming uh, something like an insect uh, who is being pinned against a wall. Uh, when I'm formulated, sprawling on a pen, and when I'm pinned and wriggling on the wall. So it's a very Kafkaesque image of an insect image, the man becoming uh, metamorphosing into an insect, a spider or whatever, which is pinned against the wall. So we have again uh, the very mystical and the very material coming together, the cinematic and the mystical coming together to create a very complex cognitive condition, a very complex sense of visual politics in this particular poem. Uh, and then, of course, we have this uh, image of the cigarette butt, which is being used to compare and, and convey the day coming to an end. And how should I begin to spit out, uh, spit out, sorry, all the butt ends of my days and ways? So again, the cigarette butt is being compared to the day coming to an end. The entire idea of exhaustion uh, is conveyed to you, uh, to us readers, as a very material thing. It's like a very mechanical, material, banal thing, a cigarette coming to an end after having been smoked. In the same way as the day is coming to an end after having been smoked away by the daily mundane activities. And how should I presume? So if you notice, uh, most of the strands are they end with uh, a question, and how should I presume, which is often rhetorical in quality. So the obvious answer is he cannot presume, he cannot have access, he cannot have entrance to that particular space. So among other things, this poem is also about a narrative crisis, uh, which informs the neurosis, something which you saw in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness already, which is a text which we uh, just concluded before we began with this one. Okay, so we have this sort of Conradian tradition of uh, a narrative crisis informing the neurotic crisis uh, happening in Eliot as well. Uh, and a large part of modernist literature is about neurosis. And I talked about George Simmel's uh, canonical text, um, you know, The Metropolis and Mental Life, which is sort of very, is a nice ethnographic text about looking at the urban city in early modernity and how that informs the nervous condition. And it's actually very interesting because if you take a look at the book, it compares the entire architecture of the modernist city, the lanes, the by lanes, the alleys, with a nervous system of the human body, right? So the lanes and streets are compared and mapped like a nervous system, which flow in information, flow out information, and there's a block of information somewhere. So a heart attack is compared to a traffic jam. It's actually quite funny. You should read it. So, you know, the entire idea of modernity being a nervous condition is something which records over and over again in some of the high modernist works. And we will look at Mrs. Dalloway and Joseph's Ulysses later in this course, which corroborate uh, this theory. Okay, so just to carry on with the poem, which is quite cinematic in quality, uh, and then we have the next stanza, which again focuses on arms. And we talked about the metonymic quality of representation in Eliot's early poetry, which is again quite cinematic. It takes certain broken images and focuses on that in terms of talk about something which is bigger. So the arms represent the body, the window panes represent the buildings, uh, a street corner represents the entire metropolis, and so on. And then we have something like, and I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare. Uh, look at the uh, continuation of conjunctions away. Uh, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, down with light brown hair. It's a perfume from a dress that makes me so digress. Arms are lying along a table, a wrap about a shawl, and should I then presume, and how should I begin? So again, if you take a look at the arms, which are braceleted and white and bare, it often has, it, it almost has a skeletal image to it. And remember, this is a time where the X-ray was a big thing uh, in modernity. So people were uh, frightened of the X-ray. At the same time, they were fascinated by the X-ray in terms of what it could show you, uh, your skeletal self, uh, which was material, which was something which was medical, but it also belonged to you to a certain extent. A lot of very funny stories about very uh, privileged uh, New York women uh, who actually had their X-rayed arms 
put up in the walls as some kind of an exhibit of themselves, uh, which was obviously a signifier of white privilege at that point in time. So this entire idea of arms being bracelets and white and bare, it seems to have a skeletal image of the human self. So again, the human self has been reduced to a skeletal image, which is part of the reduction politics in this poetry and this particular poem. Uh, the, the bearing away, the liquidation, so to say, of the human self into something quite bare and minimalist and metonymic and material in quality. Right, so I've known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, down with light brown hair. So again, it's almost like an Ophelia image uh, of uh, something which is downing with light brown hair. It's like a drowning, sinking image, which comes back at the end of the poem, by the way. It ends with a sinking image, a sinking movement. But the next uh, couple of lines are very interesting and is often quoted uh, in any research in neuroscience and literature, where the speaker says, it's a perfume from a dress that makes me so digress. So again, the whole idea of digression, which is a narrative activity, is equated with uh, the sense of smell, the sense of uh, you know, awareness of a particular smell. So I smell a particular perfume from a dress, which makes me digress, you know, very Proustian uh, and very, very synesthetic. So one particular smell takes me away to a particular memory which makes me digress from this particular narrative. So again, look at the way in which the sense, the self and the narrative are all combined together in very complex combinations in this particular poem. And then of course we come back to the image of the arm, arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume and how should I begin? So again, the question of how should I begin? How should I presume? How should I ask the question? How should I get access to that particular space? These are questions which are rhetorical in quality which keep coming up at the end of each stanza uh, as some kind of a futile questioning which never have any answer to it, which is part of the procrastination politics that this poem so dramatically depicts. Okay, and then there is an image again of narrow streets and urban metropolis, uh, which is quite uh, vein-like in quality. So again, look at the uh, you know, correlation to be made between the urban space and the human body, where the speaker says, shall I say, I've gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning from the windows. So again, the image of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning from the windows, it, it becomes a classic iconic image, very cinematic of Moderna's alienation the alienation in the metropolis. And if we take a look at some of the early cinema of, let's say, Walter Rittmann or Fritz Lang, uh, uh, of any of the German expressionist filmmakers that Elliot was aware of, you find this image of men leaning out of windows uh, in order to depict alienation was a very classic image, a very classic, iconic, early cinema image, which Elliot is obviously appropriating. And as I mentioned, if you're interested in that kind of research between modernism and cinema, David Trotter's book on cinema and modernism is a very good starting point. But again, uh, the, the, the point over here is, uh, look at the metonymic representation, the narrow streets, the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves. So the focus is on shirt sleeves, the pipes leaning out of windows. It's never really a whole image. And the lack of wholeness, of fragmentation that is used uh, to metonymize the representation is interesting because that becomes part of the alienation problem. That you know, it's so fragmented and alienated that even it cannot be represented except in fragments, right? And that becomes a compulsory condition of representation. You can only represent true fragments through a metonymic form. Uh, and that is obviously a reflective of the broader spiritual and existential alienation faced by the human subject in the metropolis. The next image is very interesting. It goes back again uh, to uh, uh, a water body image. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the flows of silent seas. So again, look at the very easy transportation between the banal and the spiritual, between the almost cosmic and the very mundane metropolis, right? So we have this image of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows, smoking pipes, which was used to depict alienation. And immediately we cut into another image, which is almost cosmic in quality, uh, aquarian in quality, definitely, uh, where the speaker says, I should have been a pair of ragged claws. So I should have been a sea animal, a sea, a sea fish, uh, a turtle perhaps, scuttling across the flows of silence silent seas. So again, a sinking image. Uh, I wish there was a sort of fantasy of being uh, situated on the floor of a silent sea, away from the hustle and bustle of metropolis, away from any economy of expectations, away from any politics of procrastination, away from any necessity to conform and be accepted as a human subject in a social space. So that fantasy of uh, being a very silent animal in the bed of a silent sea uh, is of an escape image over here, which is being depicted. Okay, uh, and then again we have 
the idea of time becoming tactile, the idea of time becoming uh, organic in quality, it almost has a body of its own. When the speaker says, and the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor, here beside you and me. So again, the afternoon, the evening, which are temporal situations, temporal windows, they're given organic qualities. They're sleeping peacefully. Uh, they are smoothing out the long fingers. They are malingering. They're stretching on the floor. So, you know, everything which is non human are given human attributes and paradoxically the human beings over here they have mechanical attributes and we'll take a look at wasteland later we will find that the typist in the wasteland is someone who actually becomes a typewriter uh, and there's an image of a gramophone on the typist and the gramophone becomes organic in quality and the typist becomes inorganic in quality so the human machine interface in modernism is very very complex so the human almost becomes machine and the machine becomes human and that's why those of you interested in post-humanism should start with modernism in terms of the starting point of literature uh, for something which actually deals with this man-machine interface quite interestingly. But over here, we have little temporal constructs, afternoon, evenings. Uh, they are said to be sleeping peacefully, lingering across flows, uh, stretching on a particular space like human beings. And then, of course, we have uh, the image of another procrastination to very genteel metaphors where the speaker says, should I after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. So tea and cakes and ices, very, very English, genteel metaphors of high tea, high culture, uh, you know, high culture conversations. Uh, after consuming that cultural conversation, should we have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? So again, the moment becomes very important in proof of. Uh, the moment is not just a space of time, not just a spot of time, it's also a spot of space. The moment is very spatial, temporal and quality and the entire crisis in proof of is about the subject's inability to inhabit the moment, uh, to actually appropriate that moment, to appropriate the moment which is passing him very, very quickly. So in that sense, uh, it is about timelessness, not in a good way, but in a very negative way. It's being left by time, it's being abandoned by time. So that sense of the abandoned subject is something which uh, modernism keeps foregrounding towards different forms of characterization. We see that uh, more medically in uh, Mrs. Jalloway by Virginia Woolf, which we will take up right after this, right? The abandoned human subject. But the point in proof of over here is he doesn't, he can't, he never really captures the moment, he never really articulates the moment, he never really inhabits the moment. And that lack of, that the crisis of inhibition, that crisis of capturing the moment is something which becomes almost medical in terms of making him procrastinate, in terms of making him neurotic, in terms of making him, you know, the language crisis his entire poem is entirely about this. He cannot inhabit and capture the moment and convey it through the proper language, which is something we saw, saw already in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. When Malo comes back from Congo, he can't really tell about the story. He can't really convey what really happened to him in that non-European space to a European audience. It is just too dark, too dark altogether, which is the last line uh, of Malo in that particular novel. Okay, and then the speaker goes on to say, but though I've wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I've seen my head grown slightly bald, bought, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here is no great matter. I've seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I've seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. Right? So again, the whole idea of the prophet, uh, the prophet image, which is represented over and over again in this particular poem, uh, you know, the speaker makes it very clear that I am no prophet and here is no great matter. And there's a sense of anti-matter in this particular poem uh, uh, because the speaker is an exhausted human subject. Uh, who is exhausted physically, spiritually, existentially, and also the level of narration. He cannot bring himself to deliver the narrative. So he's hardly a prophet. And this is hardly a great matter. This is a very shallow matter. This is a very superficial matter. And the speaker is essentially a hollow man, which becomes the subject of one of Eliot's later poems, The Hollow Man. Right? So again, those of you who can make the connection can go back to Conrad's Heart of Darkness and remember how Marlowe in that particular novel is intensely aware of the shallowness of his narrative compared to the depth of his experience, right? So he's had a deep experience which is very, very horrifying, which is full of horror. But when he comes back and wants to narrate it, uh, he realizes that the narration that he delivers in the end is a very shallow narration compared to the depth of his experience. So that dichotomy, that out of sync, that complete incompatibility between the experience and the narrative is what informs the neurosis and proof work as well. Right? So he says, I've seen my head brought in upon a platter. And then of course the uh, image of the eternal footman, which is a death image uh, from medieval times, the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. So this entire morbid image of being held by death, 
or the messenger of death is something which uh, makes the speaker more aware of his mortality and that awareness is something which informs his crisis. He, he wants to tell, get his story told but he realizes he's not really capturing time, he's not really inhabiting time, rather he's moving close towards death, he's moving close towards exhaustion and annihilation uh, symbolically as well as metabolically. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So the final stanza that I'll do I'll deal with today, uh, it has the image of Lazarus, which is a classical image of someone who comes back from the world of the dead to tell the story of what happens in the world, but it's not believed by anyone. And if you remember, uh, the poem opens with an epigram from Dante's Inferno, uh, which is again about someone coming back to tell the story of what happens in Inferno, but with the knowledge that no one will believe in. Right, so again, the whole idea of the futility of narration is being conveyed to different signifiers, classical signifiers, you know, biblical signifiers. Uh, Lazarus over here becomes obviously one of those signifiers. And then again, look at the way in which the banal material markers are used to convey something more spiritual, something non banal, something existential in quality. What the speaker says, and would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea? among the porcelain, among the talk of you and me. So again, porcelain, marmalade, tea are very, very important material signifiers of a certain class. Uh, the class of gentility, the class of urban bourgeoisie maybe, which the speaker wants to inhabit and have access to, right? So these markers keep coming back in this particular poem because that's a society that the subject is trying to situate himself in and is fading over time, right? And in a more biographical uh, note, I'm not a big fan of biographical readings. I mean, those of you interested in Eliot's life would know a large part of his early life was spent uh, as an American trying to get access to the British high society, right? So he, was, he ended up being more British than the British uh, and his whole markers, the material markers of Englishness, uh, high culture Englishness is something which became uh, a signifier of anxiety to Eliot, the young American who came in. Uh, to be accepted in this high British society, uh, this white male uh, in a genteel society of uh, art and culture. So this, this is something which may be extended into some biographical readings as well. Okay, and then it goes on to say, the speaker, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile? So again, look at the way in which matter is something which keeps coming up. The matter is about the question, the matter is about the anxiety, the matter is about the existential crisis, and it has a tactile quality to it. You know, it is possible to bite it off. Right? So again, something which is abstract, uh, the problem, the crisis, has given a material shape away. Uh, and the speaker says, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile? To have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it to some overwhelming question, to say, I'm Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. So again, this whole dichotomy, the whole crisis of meaning something and telling something else is something which keeps coming up in Eliot's poetry. So the speaker saying, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. Okay. And then the continuation of this is uh, just a corroboration of this crisis where the speaker says, and would it have been worth it after all, would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups and the skirts that trail along the floor and this and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen. Would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or trying off a shawl and turning towards the window should say, that is not it at all, that is not what I meant at all. So I, I end this particular session on this chanza because this requires a bit of an unpacking. But let's take a look at this magic lantern image, which is obviously the archetype or the, uh, the visual image which, had, which informed cinema at that point as well. So the magic lantern throwing the nerves and patterns on a screen that becomes a more potent form of representation than anything a speaker can appropriate. So it is looked at as some degree of admiration as well as envy, right? The magic lantern it, which can throw the nerves on a screen is something which is far more superior, far superior, far more potent compared to the language crisis that this particular human subject is experiencing. He cannot really tell about what happened to him. Uh, he cannot really express what he means and he acknowledges that it's impossible to say just what I mean. And this acknowledgement, this admission of failure, this admission of narrative crisis, which has obviously becomes a nervous crisis and a neurotic situation, is something which we saw in Conrad's Heart of Darkness as well, where the speaker, Marlowe, keeps saying that I, I'm, I realize the speaker, the narrative I'm telling you is absurd. It appears meaningless, but this is the best I can deliver at this point of time. 
And the same image, the same crisis of narration, the same crisis of cognition is something which uh, we see in Eliot's early poetry as well, particularly this image of the uh, speaker admitting the impossibility, acknowledging the impossibility to say just what he means, but instead looking at the magic lantern, uh, something, a machine which is throwing the nerves and patterns on a screen. And then, of course, the uh, final image uh, of the human being settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl, again, very domestic images, uh, just turning towards the speaker, uh, to the window and saying, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. So again, this break between meaning and narration is something which this poem does over and over again, and something which we spend some time with in the next lectures to come. So I'll stop at this point today, and we'll continue with this in the next lectures. Thank you for your attention.